I'm excited to welcome this week's Tierra Talk Show guest, Nick Ranieri. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. It's great to uh, to be here. Absolutely. Well, let's first talk about one of my favorite Disney projects that you've worked on, which is Emperor's New Groove. I feel like it doesn't get a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> Not as much love as I think it should, because... The, all the characters are so much fun to see play around with one another. It's a very unusual film. And just for listeners to get a background of Emperor's New Groove, which is kind of like a little twist on the Emperor's New Clothes. Uh, and Emperor's turned into a llama by his evil aunt, we could say, with Yzma. And uh, amazing cast. David Spade is the uh, selfish prince. John Goodman's Pacha. The evil Yzma is played by Eartha Kid, And Patrick Warburton is the silly cronk. You get to draw the llama version of Cusco and the human version correct that is correct yes well first of all let me um um sort of dispel some some uh rumors and some ideas about this show first of all um well first of all when you said that uh you when you first said emperor's new groove i'm like that was shocking because usually i expect well beauty and the beast or you know things like that but emperor's new groove the first film that you mentioned i I just uh, that's that's pretty that's pretty amazing and and the interesting thing is i find that i get more comments about that film than any other film i've worked on um i guess partially because i wear the crew jacket a lot i still people say they tell me how much they love that film and it and it, it, it shows that uh, it, it does have legs. I mean, when it first came out, it was panned by a lot of people. And I uh, have a lot of reviews, printed reviews, saying that it was uh, you know, something that uh, deserved to be on television instead of in the movie houses and things like that. And I don't think they quite understood the, uh, the depth of that film. Um, first of all, the, the title... Um, uh, the film itself has nothing to do with the Emperor's new clothes, or That's you know. True. That's true. That's to make. <laughs> it, it's it doesn't. It's not even kidding. In fact, people would often say that in the reviews, and uh, so it, it would be like. Uh, I mean, the the origin of that 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 uh, title itself. I don't know where they got. It. I, I don't know who actually suggested it. They were trying to come up with an alternative title. Uh, for Kingdom in the Sun, which was its original uh, uh, title. And they didn't like that. It didn't work. Um, What they did is they said, well, we don't know what to name this thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to put it up for a, like a suggestion. We're going to, what should this film be called? I guess guess it wasn't company-wide. It was probably just animation and across the street at, at the main lot and things like that. They said, give us names. And then they just picked the best one they thought was good. And we were all like, Emperor's New Groove? What? What is that? And we we all didn't like it to begin with. But it kind of grows on you, I guess. <laughs> the film went through like three incarnations. It was that Prince of the Pauper thing that Roger Allers came up with. And then when that was replaced, it was replaced with another story by Chris Williams and, and uh, Mark Dindle. And it was such a different story. It was, uh, he got turned into a llama and he, he ended up in the community and the whole film was him learning and about the community. And, but it got very complicated. So that wasn't working. So they stopped again and, and then they came up with this whole idea with the, um, you know, buddy comedy, the sort of defiant ones type of take on, uh, on, on these characters, and that's what we had ended up with at, at the end. It, it went through so many incarnations, that, that show, and uh, I, as much as I, you know, I think Roger Allers could have pulled it together and made a, made a, a really good movie at A Kingdom of the Sun, I was very happy uh, still to work on um, uh, Emperor's New Groove uh, because that was, I've often told people, that is the type of film I would have loved to have worked on had I not. That is that is true. It had the sensibilities that I liked. It was the first time I was actually able to do a lead. Um, before that, I always stuck to uh, sidekicks and uh, comedy characters because, to me, that was where my interests lie. I mean, there are people like Glenn and Andreas who they love the drama, they love the emotion, they love the, you know, making people cry, making people feel. And I always wanted just to make people laugh. I wanted to be entertaining in that way. And uh, that's what made, you know, Disney so great. You had so many different people who had different desires and those desires were um, encouraged and uh, 
we were sort of cast to to do things that we enjoy doing, and that made for better better uh, entertainment. So I really love that film. It's one of my favorite films. I had the best time on that film. It was. It I was feel true. like that film came out at a time where. They, why they weren't musicals, because Atlantis, The Lost Empire came out, Emperor's New Groove, and another one of my favorites, which you did work on, was Treasure Planet, and uh. that got panned. I, I don't understand why, uh, you know, that is probably the first Disney film that shows the mother still alive, first of all, second of all, the, <laughs> the, the dad leaves them. When has there been a Disney film that has actually shown a parent leaving on his own accord? And it's so emotional, you got to work on Dr. Doppler. Usually it's like the main protagonist gets the girl, but it's mm. the sidekick that gets the girl in this one, which is Dr. Yeah. Doppler. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, uh, Dr. Doppler, I mean, originally I was offered that role and I, I kind of, I turned it down to do Cusco. <laughs> um, and, um, but uh, the person who took it over, uh, Sergio Pablos, I mean, the guy who was is just an amazing animator. He just... It was uh, it was kind of a humbling experience to be on that crew because his uh, his draftsmanship was so solid, so good, and uh, so that was that was quite an experience. But I really like that film a lot. I think it gets a bad rap. There was a behind the scenes I got to see on Pocahontas. You appeared in it because you were doing all these little funny faces as Miko because that that is the character that you were you were animating. And did you enjoy the premise of working with a character that? doesn't talk rather than one that does? I, I'll tell you, I was scared to death when it turned from Red Feather into Miko. Um, I was very comfortable in my you know, uh, skills as animating uh, wise cracking sidekicks and things like that. And, and um, at that point, I was really sad that I gave up Timon because all of a sudden it turned from this wide cracking turkey into this mute turkey and then into this mute raccoon and and what it did is it forced me to explore the concepts of pantomime um when i was working on aladdin uh, on jafar uh one of the things that impressed me the most about that film was duncan marjibanks uh abu um and I, I always wondered, like, how does he come up with these ideas for this character? And I just, I couldn't do that. I need a voice to guide me. I need a, a some sort of dialogue, you know, to get the comedy out of. But he managed to do all this stuff without any of that. And I saw it as, as you know, impossible. So when I got Miko, I thought, how am I going to handle this character? It's, it's pantomime. And it made me grow as an animator to actually take on that challenge. It was the story and the script and me. <laughs> and I had to uh, come up with a lot of the gags. And that's why I have a story credit on that film. We would go into the uh, workbook turnovers and the, and the uh, story meetings and try to insert gags. When I say we, I meant Chris Buck and um, and Dave Brooksma, who were handling the animal characters, and we try to come up with different ideas and stuff like that. I learned so much on that, and usually you find when you're forced to stretch yourself, that's when you you rise to the occasion. And, and um, I'm just thankful that they gave me the freedom to, you know, express myself in that way and uh, and. Uh, allowed me to put in as many quote unquote gags or jokes as I possibly could because they knew they had a serious story there and they needed some lighthearted moments. And, uh, they all and, had to and you got to do something fun you shared on your Facebook page that you got to sing as John Smith in this like little <laughs> this little uh, demo you were putting together to, to test the uh, animation, correct? What is well, the story the behind this? It's so funny. It wasn't a test of the animation. Basically, we were uh, we got this thing back from Florida, the the, the first one that uh, Rachel's sister recorded, and they played it in dailies for us, and all talking about uh, Glenn Keane, and 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 at the same time, Glenn. It also happened that you know things were coming back, and Glenn was all upset, like, "Hey, where's my? Uh, I I put a head shake in that scene where she's going, you know, for me something for me or whatever." Um, and the head shake was gone. So he was all upset. And so 
a bunch of us were sitting around with that. We should we should do a response to this. And so, of course, if I never knew you was there, and so we used joking around, and you know, what about if you put your war ones on twos? And so a bunch of us, you know, the um, people that are in the uh, credits of that lyric sheet, uh, Tim Allen and Press, and uh, you know, I think uh, Dave Zabowski was part of that too. Uh, a couple other guys. We just started writing this stuff writing these lyrics and uh, at a certain point we we got the full song written and we showed uh, Glenn and he had a couple of suggestions we put that in and put his name on the credits as well with that because it, it would be better if Glenn had contributed to his own response <laughs> so we did that and then Tim Allen who uh, who was one of the animators there not the actor he uh, he had recording equipment so we thought well why don't we call Rachel and see if her sister would do it too and if, if maybe there was a part that they you know find a friend or something that could do the uh, the, the Mel Gibson part and and we didn't know that uh, Rachel's sister Terry was uh, married to a performer as well and so they said yes they're going to do it and it was really hard because unlike you know karaoke um this this uh, piece of music did not have the 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 melody track so you had nothing to follow which is what most professional singers have to go through it's really hard so uh, i tried a couple times and glenn said hey do you think i could take a go at it and he tried it, but he missed every single cue, and he he couldn't he couldn't find where he needed to sing, and and uh, so that didn't work. So I said, well, let me I'll try it again. After about three or four takes, we got one that worked, and uh, you replaced Mel Gibson's voice with your own, and right. as a John and, Smith and, part in this little yeah. parody. And like I said in my description, there my range is not quite as as good as it should be. It was really hard to hit some of those notes. You could hear me straining and things like that. I. Uh, and uh, you know, um, I, uh, I know when they record some people at, uh, for the movies, like um, Danny DeVito during Hercules, when he sang his song, they bumped him up. They fixed some of his performance because he's not a professional singer. And uh, every now and then he'll hit a sour note, and so they are able to, you know, you know, mechanically adjust it so that he's he wasn't off key and things like that. Now, I didn't have that luxury. <laughs> Um, it sounds who, very professional. Well, I tried, and Nancy actually came off really well too. And uh, so I, I thought, you know, it came off. Like I said in the the little description there, I said one of the, the only reason, one of the reasons I like mine, my version is because uh, I tried to mimic Mel, um, whereas Andy um, basically sang it as professionally as possible. So you know, full vibrato and things like that. And it sounded very nice and all that, but it wasn't quite the way Mel Gibson sang it and things like that. So although his performance is great and, and if I had to choose one, I'd probably choose his because he has a better singing voice. Um, it's still, uh, if I were there to direct him, I would have asked him to, to uh, make it sound a little bit more like Mel. Um, but other than that, uh, it was uh, pretty successful, I think. And uh, everybody had a, a good attitude and, and uh, that the people who had the music were able were allowing them to do this because at that time the music was, you know, not supposed to get out. So uh, Disney had a good, you know, had a good sense of humor. And now I have three Disney questions I always ask all my guests. I call them the Fab Three. So we'll start with the Donald one. So as a child... What Disney film would you always like to watch over and over again? For me, uh, I, I can't really say it's my favorite, but it was the very first film where I recognized the possibilities of Disney animation. Um, and that would be Pinocchio. And because of my history and humor, um, I grew up a TV kid. So all my influences, all my comedy sort of sensibilities stem from television and uh, so when people ask what are my influences you know they're expecting to hear oh Frank and Ollie Milk Callers like no my influence is Dick Van Dyke the Dick Van Dyke show I mean that stuff's brilliant to me sometimes when I do lectures I show clips of some of these shows and some of them are just brilliant his his, his uh, like Dick Van Dyke he has in his in his series he uh, there are elements where it's really natural, but there's so much 
um, exaggeration and cartoony attitudes and stuff, um, but they're not over the top. They're not uh, garish. They're they're naturally um, performed, but there's so much um, exaggeration in a lot of his uh, facial expressions and and the way he you know uh, the, the, some of the secondary actions that he does and things like that gain so much from from watching. I'm watching him. To get back to it, uh, Pinocchio was the first Disney feature where I actually laughed. It was one of those films where, hey, this is really great stuff. You know, uh, I, I remember seeing it as a little kid, but it's when I rediscovered it later in my teens. You know, things like P I N P I N. We're wasting precious time. You know, he could spell. You know, and you know the stuff on the card. Yeah, dishonest John gave me this. Trying to hold up this little card, and and Lampwick's not listening to him, and just different things like that. And uh, um, you know, father, it's not my father. You know, <laughs> I just just things where I got a chuckle out of. Uh, and and Pinocchio was the first film where. I actually uh, uh, thought, hey, this stuff was pretty, uh, pretty sharp. And our goofy question, what Disney character do you think would be your best friend if you met them in person? And now for this one, I'll let you choose one that you have animated and one that you have not animated. Ooh, that's a, uh, I've never, never was ever asked me that question before. Miko or something, I, I, I don't know. That That's a hard question to answer. I, I, I've never, I never thought of them as, as, you know, friends in that way, you know, it's, uh, maybe Charlotte, she's not your typical, you know, mean girl. You think she's going to be that, but she's really, you know, innocent in her own way. She's just reacting to her environment, but she's not mean. And that's one of the things that appealed to me about that character. And, and I always tried to, you know, play her and animate her with uh, a spark, like it's just a happy go lucky character. And our Mickey question, if I asked you to name any Disney song at this moment, what immediately comes to mind? What immediately comes to mind? The song that would have been, which is um, in Hercules. There was some talk of, of uh, Hades having a song in that. <gasps> what? Oh, that would have been amazing! I, I talked to, I remember I was talking to Alan Menken. I said, why, why didn't Hades have a song? And he said, you know, I always, he said, I always want to do a song for Hades. And I know exactly what I would have done had I had a chance to do a song for Hades. It would have been sort of in that vein of uh, take a walk on the wild side. It's like a Velvet Underground uh, Ooh, song. Hey, I babe, like take a walk on the wild side. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> That would have been so Hades, and I know James would have loved to have performed that because it was sort of sing speak. It's not he wouldn't have necessarily been singing, but it would have been such a cool thing to have him do, you know. And I always re was sad that you know Alan never got to write it and James never got to perform it, you know. <laughs> I got one of my favorite scenes cut from that film, um, which will show up in the next year or so when I get into Hercules, which I'm, you know, gearing down, winding down on Pocahontas uh, uh, next couple of months. Uh, I'll start working into Hercules now. But yeah, there's there was some there was a scene that made it almost to color. Um, uh, it got to effects, but they eventually cut it. I'll, I can't I'll, wait to see it. So now this will be on your Facebook page, which listeners can check out, which is... Yeah, it's Nick Ranieri-Animator. Well, Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was a real treat. I love listening to behind the scenes of how animated films are made, and I'm sure listeners would love to check out your Facebook page. Check for it below in the show notes and on our website at www.thetrtalkshow.com. So again, thank you so much for coming on the show, Nick, and you need to keep us informed when your next animated film will be. I would love to hear about it because you just do amazing, amazing work with your characters. They come out perfectly with the final oh, product. So, so much, Tammy. I really appreciate it. It was great talking with you, and we will have to do this again sometime. <laughs>